Hi, this is Tim Andrews, President Chief Executive Officer of ASI. Thanks very much for joining us today on this webinar. Uh, I'm joined by four people. Uh, Joe Gilley, CEO of Overture Promotions. Phil Cousin, President of BAMCO. Joanne Lance, President and CEO of Geiger. Craig Nadell, President and CEO of Jack Nadell International. Uh, all are members of our uh, very prestigious Counselor Power 50 uh, list of, of influencers, and they're also part of the top 40, uh, representing the, some of the largest, most prestigious companies uh, among the distributors in the promotional price industry in, in the United States. So, um, And uh, they also are very important because last March, uh, when we were just beginning this journey that we've been on through a uh, pandemic, uh, the four of them also joined on really what was the first panel discussion in the industry to talk about what this looked like and what we were expecting. So uh, we're all survivors uh, in, in both ways. We've all been lucky um, from a health perspective, and we've also been lucky in our business perspective, I think. So we're gonna spend time together. Um, I'm also gonna be taking questions. So um, if you're in the audience on the right-hand side, you'll see a chat area. If you type your questions in there, I'll be happy to try to put those in during the conversation and also take a few at the end if we're able to, depending on the time. And we'll be wrapping up around 4.30. So uh, thanks very much, everybody, for joining. Let's you know get started. Um, it's been quite a year, uh, and we're going to talk a lot more about the future than the past. But let's kick off by just sort of going around the virtual room we have, and just let's you know how how did each of your companies you know come out of this? You know how are they doing? And uh, sort of what was the high and the low of the last 15 months? Uh, let's start with uh, with Craig. Oh wow! I figured you would start with some. <laughs> Uh, we were off last year. I, as far as I can tell, I think we did a little bit better than the industry. Um, but we were we were off about I don't know 15, 18 uh, percent after COVID hit. We were running pretty well January, February. Um, this year, June has been amazing. June has been far ahead of even 2019. But for the most part, since about October, we had been running ahead of the year um, ahead of COVID years but a little bit behind 19. Uh, October, November, December were good. January, February, March, not as good. April, May, definitely better. Um, so we're, we're running better and June has been fantastic. And hopefully I, I'm, people do feel busy. I think, I think business is very much coming back. It feels like it's over, I guess, to me. Um, I actually think we'll run ahead of 19. Well, I think the rest of the year will be a record for us for the, for the, back half of the year. And from a business perspective, what was sort of the high and the low of the year? Not not financially, but other other kind of metrics. And then we'll move on to um business. yeah, well, I mean there were more lows. It was it was the the high I think for for me is is we were able to we went into it in a very good place. We're pretty conservative. So we were able to to get some money to our salespeople. Uh, we did this boost program if they could call on a few things, do a, a few extra things to try and help people out during a pretty tough time. So mm -hmm. that was kind of satisfying to do that. Mm -hmm. um, the low was, was it was it was challenging. I think it was challenging, not just because business was off, but um, emotionally, I mean, compared to 2008, 2009 kind of a thing, at least you had a normal life kind of a deal. Um, and it's hard to, to I, I don't enjoy working from home as much. I think you don't work as efficiently um, I like to see people face to face. I think many of us do. So it was a, a challenging year in that regard. We did a new implementation, a new system implementation, and those are always difficult. The hindsight, or, or who would have known? The timing of it was pretty challenging, was, was difficult, was bad. We did it right before COVID, and um, so no one was in the office to help remediate the issues that inevitably come up. And then all the drop shipments added a whole a whole other layer of complexity that we never anticipated. And frankly, I think for the whole industry to go from, we had about 20% of our shipments went to residents before COVID and now it's about 65 or 70. So where we used to ship two, two batches of 500 or something, now it's 500 to, to individual residents. And, and that's, that's much more difficult to deal with all the way, all through the system. So uh, it wasn't a super fun year in that regard. Personally, it was a great, very satisfying year for me. My family did really well. My my oldest child got married and is pregnant. Is actually going to have her son probably any day now. Um, nice. And my son finished his PhD, so he's 
Dr. Brian now, and my, my youngest daughter is also pregnant, expecting her second child. So it was a really good year for my nuclear family. That was fun. So that's great. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, let's shift to Joanne. Well, thanks, Tim. Hi, how you doing? Great. Awesome. Good. Uh, before I begin, Tim, I want to extend my condolences to you, the ASI family, and Dan Healy's family. Uh, it's so sad to have, have learned about his passing this week and his young family. So uh, from us to you, um, nothing is more important than individual's health and uh, well-being. We ended up last year uh, down, but not as bad as what we thought uh, originally. Certainly not as tough as what we thought back in March and April when we were speaking. We ended up the year down 12.5%. Uh, so we consider that a success and we are on plan this year on plan for profits uh, a little bit behind sales plan uh, But profitability right on plan. So we consider that uh, we we knew this would be a difficult year coming out uh, Especially trying to overcome all those PPE sales and we're, we're on target uh, the highs and the lows uh, the, the lows have to be uh, when we had colleagues who had COVID uh, and uh, either had long-term health issues or lost loved ones. Uh, everyone is touched by this, and health is so important. Uh, health, health supersedes anything on a financial standpoint or on a sales standpoint, so that's the low. Uh, for me personally, the low was on June 16th, uh, the day that I met personally with those individuals who had to drop their computers off because they were either on furlough or layoff. And I and Jean and Pete uh, met outside, masks on, uh, but greeted every single individual and apologized to them uh, for the impact this had on their family. Um, the high was the day they all came back or the day they came back ahead of schedule and nothing beats that. We were so happy about that and we had this great uh, winter sales surge. I think you all had that and those were definitely the highs Great, and did you see much difference between you have a UK businesses as, as well as US so sort of Tell us just for a, a bit about how that difference sort of unfolded and, and how how do you handle that? UK is tracking two weeks ahead of us. So we actually now they are, they've been our barometer in so many ways uh, for sales they uh, when we saw that they they started dropping about 10 days before our sales dropped they overcame sales the same way that we overcame uh, so a very very similar track very similar path similar clients but two weeks ahead of us great uh, let's move to joe hi tim thanks for having me we actually had a really good year in uh, 2020. It was our best year ever. Um, combination of things, you know, PPE. Also, we had three or four real pandemic proof kinds of customers. In fact, a couple of them in the delivery segment that thrived um, in the pandemic. So, uh, so we were quite fortunate to have that kind of business. Um, and, and so, you know, I would say the lows were in the those first few weeks just so uncertain and, and not knowing are we making the right decisions, kind of having no idea. And then that moment when we started to realize that this is going to go on a really long time. Uh, that was because we we were thinking, oh, we'll all be back in September, <laughs> whatever, and we weren't. Um, the highs for us, um, we were so busy March through May of 2020 that we actually our staff who were all working remote. We had them come in and they were working shifts, so. We got to see everybody, which was kind of cool. Um, and and then um, we were able to uh, have a parking lot party in the summer. That was really fun. We had a great time. So those were the highs. That's great. Thank you, Phil. Called in via my phone because my uh, 
audio dropped out. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, you're fine. Okay, great. Um, thanks so much for, for having us on. Um, yeah, I think for us, in terms of high lows, you know, I'll start with the lows on the low front, similar to, to what you've heard already, which is pretty straightforward. We had team members get very sick uh, from COVID, and we had team members that lost family members, and uh, and that was not easy. Uh, that was definitely not easy. That was that was the, the kind of continuous low throughout. Um, on the high front, I would say that, that we came together as a team to support one another and our families and our communities in a in a really incredible manner, and and we worked at food banks and put on vaccine drives and really stepped up into a position of leadership throughout the, the crisis. And I, I was so proud to see that from our team. I was pr so proud to see our team came together. That to me was just a continuous high throughout. Um, you know, as, a, as an company, uh, we, we did amazing. We're, we're in a real amazing place. You know, we grew by 88% last year organically um, and crossed over the $200 million mark. Um, in, in Q1, we grew by 125% uh, compared to 2020. So the, the growth continues uh, in terms of the promo side of the business and uh, shipping over 20,000 packages a day. Um, and, and we put up our, our biggest promo sales uh, sales by quarter, quarter over quarter. So Q4 was our largest in terms of promo sales. And then we broke that again in, in Q1 2021. So, you know, for us, we look at it right now and and feel really good about where we're at. You know, I, I do believe that adversity reveals, you know, character. And, and the more challenging I think that the environment became, the more our team really glued together and, and the company really excelled as a result. So I was, I was really proud of proud of that in spite of all the uh, the challenges that we faced as, uh, as a team uh, personally throughout this. You mentioned organic sales, but you've been doing a lot of recruiting, I think. So is that is that truly organic or is that because of acquiring, you know, either other distributorships or having other people join you? Yeah, when we use the term organic, we're talking about uh, organic in the traditional sense of the word, right? acquisition versus uh, acquisition of companies versus um, non-acquisition of companies. Uh, yes, we've definitely done uh, a fair amount of uh, of adding talent to the team, you know, as much as we possibly can. We try to find you know, the best talent both inside and the outside the industry, um, and and that that certainly helped our growth for sure. Um, and and not only have we gotten you know, really talented members on board, but they've had some of their best years ever. So um, you look back at our, our sales team last year for a good a good portion was their best year by far and away. Um, and so, so yeah, um, it, was, it was definitely a, a good year for, for them as well. Great. So as I said, Paul, in our, in our very first webinar back in March of 2020, we had no video. You know, while video was certainly invented back in March of 2020, we weren't taking advantage of it yet. We, we've all learned a lot from technology. Um, and I know a number of you have been using technology to reach out not only to your colleagues, but also your customers and to others in the industry. So I'd like to sort of just talk about, you know, what changes you implemented during the pandemic and specifically, though, which ones are permanent? So we, we've all, you know, tried to do things in our businesses and, and in interacting that, that are temporary, perhaps, and we'll get into some of the coming back to work things. But sort of what, what are those technical things or, or whatever that you that you really adopted and used that you think are a permanent part of the way you're going to operate? And, and I want to go to Joanne. I, you know, I've been on Joanne's list for some of her uh, from her videos that are that are quite insightful about not only what the business is doing, but also the industry. So, so Jan, Joanne, uh, you, you use a lot of technology. So tell us a little bit about that. and then. And which pieces of those are permanent, you think? Well, uh, right after uh, we uh, sent our office associates home, I uh, instituted a weekly video uh, touch base uh, to associates. And so obviously the technology of having cameras and uh, computers and everybody and having their multiple screens at home had to be one of the first things that was a change. Um, those videos were, were really uh, quite helpful because I had two groups. I had the group of individuals who were on furlough and then all of the office and DDC associates on a global basis. So I actually had two distribution groups. And every week I did, when I would contact them, it might be a three minute inspirational video. It was a once a month business update, just completely transparent. Here's where we're at, here's where we're going, here's our goals, those types of things. And uh, that, that certainly helped stay in touch uh, and allowed me to interact uh, with those people who are on furlough, that was tough. That was very, very difficult for them. So they felt connected and they knew exactly, they got the business updates, so they knew exactly where we're at. Uh, we in implemented two-factor authentication last year. That was part of the plan, but we accelerated it uh, because of everybody being at home. Uh, the, you know, you have all of the security issues 
Uh, so we beefed up our security, security and continued invest in doing so. We also did a technology audit to make sure that we knew exactly what we had to do uh, for security, uh, for, for technology uh, for uh, coming uh, forward. Uh, buying cameras, that was hard. There was no, you know, we talk about lack of inventory. If you recall this time last year, it was hard to get cameras. And uh, and now we, we all are on Teams, we use Microsoft Teams, and we have a cameras on policy. Uh, so you can't just be go show up in a meeting and turn your camera off because your hair doesn't look good or the background. It's uh, uh, you're expected to show up to work like you have showed up to work in the past. Uh, so that was uh, that was a practice that changed. Finally, the thing that we made is a business decision last fall that we are no longer going to use towers for computers. And as we continue to replace computers, we're going to strictly laptops so that we'll have more flexibility in the future. It's gonna take a little time and we'll talk about that later uh, to before we can get everybody on a laptop, but we are only buying laptops for every position. Uh, and we made that decision last year. Thank you. Uh, let's go to Craig. Craig, technology changes that you did or business changes and ones especially that are, that are gonna stick around. You know, things that you, you made a decision and that was a good decision for the business and it's gonna be with you, you know, going forward. Um. Well, you know, to be honest, Tim, sometimes you do the right thing for the wrong reason. <laughs> and we switched basically everything to the cloud was one of the main precipitating things why we went to the, what, one of the reasons why we implemented a new system. We went all notebooks years ago. We had our email all in the cloud with the servers. Mm -hmm. And we did it, frankly, because I was worried an earthquake would take down HQ. Mm -hmm. And we'd, we'd be out for a week or two. I never would have foreseen this I probably should have, uh, you know, now we all read the stories about experts have been warning for years and years and years. This is the thing to worry about, but I was oblivious to it, I guess. Uh, we didn't do it because of a pandemic, but I think we were pretty well situated to work remotely and have everything in the cloud. And frankly, we did it because I was worried about an earthquake, which here in Southern California is a legitimate fear that there could be an earthquake that would take down the, the office for a week or two, not 15 months. So we were reasonably well set for people to work from home. Uh, we went all Zoom a couple of years ago. We're, we're basically all in the cloud uh, with the Microsoft servers that are up that have better security, presumably that, you know, so we didn't have to change that much in that regard. And we didn't do it from any great foresight. Uh, it was the right thing for the wrong reason. But, uh, we didn't have to take that part. We didn't have to fret about. So, Joe. So we moved into a new building at the end of 2019. And as part of that move, we uh, standardized on Zoom phones and set up Zoom conference rooms. So uh, we, we were just in time for the uh, pandemic. And, and you know, by the time we sent everybody home, everybody was used to using Zoom. So we had a pretty easy transition to that most of our um, front of house staff have laptops already um, so the the interesting thing now is uh, how to uh, how to transition to hybrid work so what do you need at home and what do you need at the office and how to make that work seamlessly so those are the kinds of things we're thinking about now um, we added two more Zoom conference rooms, um, and um, we're, we did some a lot more uh, security training for phishing and um, that kind of stuff. We changed our spam. We kind of upgraded our spam software, and we added, um, they always have to remind me what it is, EDR, which is endpoint detection and response software, um, which... Um, you know, would help in a kind of ransomware sort of situation. So we upgraded security, did some training, um, and carried on with Zoom. <laughs> Thank you. Um, what changes did you make, you know, technology business-wise that, that you're going to stick with that you think really added to your success in 2020 and as you're looking ahead at growth in 21? I, mean, I, I think, um, you know, for us, we made a lot of investment years ago. Um, Probably, probably similar to, to Craig, not for those particular reasons, obviously, uh, right? Things for the wrong reasons, or, or um, so. But we, but we we didn't really find ourselves um, having to, to repair the plane while mid-flight, 
you know, we started making capital investments in, in tech, you know, every year since almost the founding of our business. And so 2020 was no different. Um, and we, we've got about 75 programmers on staff. So we're continuously building out our tech stack and our various platforms. Um, you know, being cloud-based is something that we've had for, for well over a decade now. Um, and I think just by the nature of the fact that, that we always like to try to find the best talent, no matter where it is in the world, we, we're pretty spread out as a company um, already. And so I think the vast majority of the company is pretty used to working virtually. Um, so, so there wasn't much of an adjustment there. Um, and we'll, we'll continue with that. I mean, I think the continuous investment in technology development and evolving infrastructure is just a permanent part of our long-term strategy. So, um, you know, I think uh, I think that that will just continue continue forward. Um, and, and in general, we think about infrastructure and technology investments in terms of of years or decades, not in terms of, of quarters. So, um, as a result, we've, we've invested a lot over the years, and that's helped out. I, you know, we were going to probably talk more about coming back to the office or not, and how that might work in, in this panel. But in general, I, I feel like we've set ourselves up to be a, a mostly virtual company. Um, just because our, our, our talent is so spread out throughout the globe. So in fact, let's just stick with that, you know, uh, that work from home and sort of, you know, I assume that your people were working from home in 2020, most, mostly after March. Sort of, you know, as you're thinking about the second half of 21 and going into 22, sort of where are you in that decision process? Where are all of us, I guess, in that decision process of bringing people back in an office, not bringing them back, you know, hybrid and how does that work? So where are you in that decision process and, and what are your current thoughts about that? I mean, I, I think it, it does depend a bit on the individual um, in terms of whether or not they, they work better from home or not. Um, you know, different people have, have uh, different preferences there. Yeah, as a company, uh, yeah, so we, we've, been, we've been working virtually since, uh, since, the, since the shutdown and we've had various offices in various countries, you know, kind of open and shut down at, at different times. Um, you know, for us, I think we're going to continue to offer long-term a, a real great hybrid solution. Uh, a lot of what we, the way we think about this is, you know, what's going to be best for our team and what's our team going to going to appreciate the most and, and work the hardest uh, hardest for for the mission. Um, uh, and I think the flexibility is something that is is everyone right realize during this time is a huge thing that people like. Um, there's definitely benefits to being able to see people face to face. Does everyone need to see everyone face to face every day? That that for us is something that we're not really sold on. So at this point, you know, we're looking at at, at kind of crawling before we walk here, uh, doing a hybrid reopening in our various U.S. offices. Some of our offices in other countries have been open for quite some time. For example, our China office, where you know COVID went uh, went you know, shut down that office first, but also we came back first in that office. Um, that will remain open for for as long as you know COVID is at bay there. But I think in general, um, to be able to offer flexibility to the, the team um, and, and be able to offer some, some ability to make some decisions whether or not you want to sit in traffic every day or drive in the office every day or not. Uh, there's, there's some real advantages to that in terms of recruiting and, and retaining really great talent. So I think, I think we're going to continue down that path a bit, a bit longer here. We'll see. So when you, when you mean hybrid, when you say hybrid, are you meaning two or three days in the office and two or three days at home? Or are you meaning some people are out, some people are in. Uh, sort of, how are you viewing, you know, how that how that all works? Because I think for me, that's one of the complications is sort of, you know, are the people in that need to be in for me to communicate with them? So how are you thinking about that? And then I'll move around the room. So what, when I think about people in the office, um, I think about it in two for two, two two reasons. Number one is the camaraderie aspect. So you know, we definitely want to coordinate certain days in which you might have a lot of people in. Um, that, that way, a lot of people just get to have a lot of crossover. Um, we might do more events as well in order to create that. And the second thing is important meetings. And, and that's something that I don't really want to dictate, you know, from the top. I think it's probably one of those things that's best done, you know, on a team by team basis as teams need to get together and come in. But we have a lot of teams that have always worked together virtually for years and we'll just continue to do so. Um, and then we have other teams that, that, uh, that maybe work a little bit more like some of our design team, especially on the fashion side, you know, it's better to be there and actually be able to, to design in person. So they might all want to get together and do that more often. Um, so we'll move it pretty flexible. Um, and uh and and really do what's best for for the team um and do what's best for our overall output great joe so you moved into a new building at the end of 19. any regrets <laughs> are you excited about being back in the office i mean sort of and and do you have multiple locations i'm really sure what your configuration is so so how are you looking at coming back and, and how's it going to work so we had our back of house staff and probably 10 percent of our front of house staff worked full-time in the building through the pandemic 
Um, and so um, we were a designated emergency services provider. Um, and, and so, you know, took all the precautions and everything. So we actually had, you know, a fair number of front of house people who continued to work in the office uh, through the pandemic. We're 83% vaccinated, so people are back. Um, we're leaving it up to each team to decide, the front of house teams to decide what their policy for their team is and which days they want their team in. So, uh, you know, I think most of the sales teams are trying to have um, their teams in on the same day, like two days a week seems pretty common um, right now. Um, you know, I know that lots of the teams are hoping by the fall we'll be at three days a week um, just for collaboration and problem solving. And some of the um, programs are complex and it helps um, to have sales teams meeting with operations and um, going in the back of house and seeing how the line set up, whatever. Um, so, uh, you know, there's a lot to be said for um, how people feel aligned with mission um, and it goes up when they're in and together. Um, and so, you know, we um, have been talking together as a company with the employees um, about what that looks like. Um, and we have a big space in the building. We call it the retreat. It has a papa shot and um, uh, ping pong table and and we're we're setting it's been our distance lunchroom during the pandemic so post pandemic it will be like a like a more casual working place a work from home kind of in the office with couches and chairs and work tables and um, to give people an opportunity to move around the building and work in different configurations work together um, and hopefully um, build some draw for people to come back to the building. Joanne, uh, what are you doing at Geiger? Well, similar to what Phil said, prior to the pandemic, we had a work from home program. So we already had a large number of our employee workforce working from home pre-pandemic. Uh, I'm gonna focus only on the Lewiston headquarters office and the London headquarters office because uh, those are the two where we have really large quantities of employees. Uh, our uh, Decoration and Distribution Center employees, they worked 100% through the pandemic. Like Joe, they were classified as essential workers. They were there. Uh, unlike Joe, our office workers pretty much all went home. We only had a few people who were in the building who were either maintaining, you know, like our NOC team, maintaining some of infrastructure or something like that. Um, Living in Maine in the summer is pretty heavenly. There's a reason why we're a vacation land. So uh, back a couple months ago, I told all our Maine employees and our London employees, plan a working from home, if you like, until October 1st. However, if you want to work in the office, it's absolutely up to you. All we ask is that you be vaccinated. And so we have a small group of people who are in both offices, very small. And it turns out most people don't want to come back to work. That is a fact. They like working from home. So what we, we're doing now is we're working on a process where we are, we're, going to, we're going to shift to more of a hybrid workplace. Now, I can't accommodate everybody hybrid all at once because that does require an investment of some infrastructure, some computers and those types of things. And it's more expensive to maintain a hybrid environment. Because if you need three computer screens to work from home, you need three screens to work in the office. It's That's a fact. You know, When you're in the office, you have to be able to have the same type of technology that you have at home, and that's a doubling up of docking stations and those types of things. So we're slowly going, we're going to have to, on October 1st, identify who are the lucky ones who have that brass ring, that they will be able to be the true hybrids until we can get everybody converted to hybrid. And then we'll be a hybrid. We will be a hybrid company, both U.S. and U.K. And um, you know, you mentioned vaccinations required, and I'm going to circle back to to, to, um, to Joe in a second on this same question. Um, are you going to require people to be vaccinated to come in the office full time? Not on, a, not, not, on October, yeah, 
sorry, I didn't mean to speak over you. Not on October 1st. First of all, for our essential workers, they do not have to be vaccinated. If they are vaccinated, they don't have to wear masks right now. These are those that are required to work. Uh, and if they choose not to be, and they are considered classified as essential, then they mask up and they follow protocols. For the office right now, they have to be vaccinated because it's a voluntary basis. On October 1, when we call people back, then it's their choice of whether they're vaccinated or not. And then we'll follow CDC protocols at that time on whether they wear a mask or not, or whatever CDC says we, we should be doing. I want to understand, and I'm going to go back to Joe just for a second, because I think you, you used a stat of 82 or 88 percent of your team is vaccinated, which is interesting to me. So, you know, I guess you're asking them and they're telling you. And are you requiring them to be vaccinated if they come back in the office? Or what's your thought about that? And, and how was the enthusiasm for, for sharing the vaccination status, if, if that is something that you did ask? We actually had a local clinic administer the vaccination. So we set them up, set up appointments for our staff um, when it when it was a little hard to get them. So we were fortunate to be able to offer them. So, you know, we were um, helping them with the paperwork and setting up their time slots. And um, so that's how we know. Um, and we're still, you know, as people change their mind, they contact our HR manager and she sets up an appointment for them at the clinic. So, um, and um, and then others of them um, told us. Um, and and so now our the policy is that um, if you're vaccinated, um, you don't have to wear a mask. There are some people in the warehouse who still do, even though they're vaccinated. And if you are not vaccinated, you have to wear a mask in the building. Great. Craig? Uh, well, we have a little bit of a different take, I guess. Uh, first, and, and I'm here in California, although so is Phil, um, there's a lot more liability. And also just for the fairness of it, we're, we're very much trying to implement the same policy across the board. Um, we're, we, we don't want to have some people claim, oh, uh, this person got to work from home and I didn't or whatever else. And, and at the end of the day, we think we work better in the office. It's much more efficient. There is that office energy. I think Phil referred to that. That's definitely a part of it. But but just uh, the collaboration, the brain power. I know I work much better going up. If if there's something going on, just grab the two other people involved, and you know we step in somebody's office. So we are going to be back at work. We're kind of in phase three of a four-step phase, and right now it's I think this is the third week of it where we're asking everyone to be here two days a week, and unless something blows up, which obviously it might. We started to have people come back last summer and then it spiked again. So we we pulled back and had it completely voluntary. We kind of went to step one and, and went back to step zero. Um, but the plan is next month to have everyone back in the office. And there are a couple of exceptions that we've extended for a few months that we could do it. But you know, for the fairness and liability, we're going to expect everyone to come back. We work better back in the office, I think, uh, in every regard. I think the salespeople do better in the, in the um, non salespeople do better when they can collaborate so um that's our that's our plan and it's going to be for everybody so. okay you know there's a lot of discussion uh, across the country in every industry about labor shortages and price points for employees going up and 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 to people you know having incredible trouble finding employees so i just want to see you know what's your take on this and what are you experiencing and of course you know you the four of you have different levels of employees and some of you have distribution centers, others don't, but sort of what's your current experience, you know, there and, and you know, what, what do you, what do you see the outlook's going to be for that and how, how's it impacting your business? Let's start with Phil. I mean, I think, um, okay, I think it's always tough to find good people, um, even, even in, uh, you know, uh, great labor markets, good people are, are hard to identify and find, and, and we're always struggling to make sure that we find the, the best of the best out there. So I think it's, it's always hard for us. Um, we never feel like hiring is easy. Um, and, you know, I think right now is, is definitely you know, tight um, for sure. Labor market tight. Uh, the answer for that for us is really culture. You know, I just, I think we focus on, on building a place that is, is just very unique, 
where talented people want to be. And, and we've been on the, the PPBB, the PPB uh, best places to work list for the last four years. And just learned we're going to be on the LA Business Journal list for the fifth straight year. And that, that's just because we are hardcore focused on that culture. And, and we, the way we think about it is if we just create a great culture and a place where people want to come to work, they want to come to grow, you know, it allows us to be a destination that tracks talent. And, and so, you know, I think that, right, the labor markets are, are tight right now. Um, but, you know, you can also make the argument that, you know, I think people feel more comfortable now than in the past year of, of leaving a job that they're not so happy with and, and changing and taking a chance. And so there's an opportunity there as well. Um, and, and so, so I, I do think that I'm guessing that the labor market will remain tight for, for some time here. Um, but I, I do think there's some opportunity there as well. In it. Uh, and, and I think that if we, if we focus on the culture side, uh, we'll, we'll get the people that, that we want. But I, I think even when it's, even when it's a, a, a real a market with high unemployment, it's still very challenging always for us to find really talented people. And Joe, how are you finding it in the Chicago area? So it's really hard finding employees for the warehouse um, and for embroidery, screen print, kidding. It's hard. Um, we're near Uline and Amazon. They're offering crazy starting hourly rates with thousand dollar signing bonuses. And um, so it's hard. Um, you know, we're, we had to up our, temp agency rate um, and what happens is people will come and they stay a day and then they don't show up the next day because they found a job that pays higher so um, you know it's sort of the workers are realizing their worth and their value and and um, as Phil said you know leaving jobs they don't like for ones they like as well and now, you know, once people get a taste of Amazon, sometimes we get them back because <laughs> it's hard. Um, so it's a uh, it's struggle. It's um, as a management team, we spend a lot of time brainstorming ways to find good warehouse staff. And uh, Joanne, uh, primarily in Lewis and you also are in, which is a which is a, which is not Chicago, not LA. Uh, but you're also in London. So, you know, what's your sense of the job market uh, where you are? And how are you attracting people to the extent that you're doing any hiring? You're starting to look. Well, I, you know, Phil was right. Finding good people has always been a problem, always been difficult, always a challenge. And that's why we had our work at home program pre pandemic. So it didn't matter for an office position, whether you were at marketing or accounting or finance or billing or programmer, where you lived. We, so we had a national search for all of those positions, CSRs. And so we continue to have that practice and that's how we've been able to fill and hold those positions, especially people move from state to state. There's a lot of movement for individuals. If they can hold their job and move to Northern Colorado or New Mexico, that's been very good. For our decoration and distribution centers, uh, Joe, we had the same uh, issues, especially during that last fall. I call it the fall sales surge because sales just pushed right up in the fall and in winter uh, with the kidding projects. And we implemented a friends and family program. It's a program we've used several times when labor, when there's been labor shortages. And we simply ask our employees, do you have a friend or family that right now you can recommend to work for us? And that has been a godsend because we have grandparents and aunts and uncles and cousins uh, that have come back and people will only recommend individuals who will show up because if they don't show up they feel like it's a reflection of them and so that program has been terrific and that's how we've been staffing both the london decoration and distribution center and in the lewiston one so if you don't have a friends and family program i really strongly consider it because they're your best recruiters great thanks Craig, um, you know, what's your take on this? And, and also we had a question from, from the audience that I sort of want to weave in here, you know, in terms of saying that you want to require employees to come back, are you concerned, and other people can chime in on this, but are you concerned about that that's going to limit the ability for you to recruit or retain because people do want that level of flexibility or do you think that's going to be woven into what your ultimate plan is? Well, um, 
All right, so you got a lot of things. First, before I get to the question, that'll be no secret, uh, you know, the same, the same two things. I do think, I think we should all look at people, uh, this, this labor shortage as good news. I think the entire industry should. I think in a sense, it's almost like we're an outsourced marketing department when we're doing our job well. And so our clients and prospects can't find people in the marketing department and here we are to help. So I think that bodes very well for our business. I've always thought the unemployment rate is a pretty good indicator for, the, for how well our industry is going to do, at least those of us that consult more. Um, there's no secret with, I think, getting the right people you guys touched on, at least for us, I think it's like a lot of things. It's, it's pay and, and culture and fit. I, I think very few people work only for money and very few people, the money doesn't matter. So you wanna pay people well and fairly, but you wanna have a, an enjoyable workplace, a, a good environment. And that, I guess, goes to the second one, Tim, and I think probably some of each. You know, Yes, there, there are good people who want to work from home. And if we ask people to work in the office, we are going to not be able to attract and get those people. So in that regard, yes. On the other hand, I think the office energy and the culture and the enjoyable, environment that we tend to have, I think does attract some people and, and which one is going to weigh more. Um, for us, I think it's going to be the second one, but it's unquestionably some of each. There's no doubt as we're going back to the office, we have a few talented people that don't want to come back and, and we are going to probably lose them. And that's painful. You hate to lose somebody who's good at any time. Phil pointed out, it's hard to get good people. But I think in the long run, having a, an office and an energy and a culture and a supportive environment and a place where everyone is treated fairly bodes well for us but it's a balance there's no i i don't i wouldn't claim that there's any all one or all the other you you gain and you lose on each side and, and which one weighs more than the other uh for us we think it's going to be the latter but a, a reasonable person could conclude differently so i don't know if that answers the question but that's the way <laughs> Well, we'll have to see how it plays out in a couple of years. Um, so it's no secret that that labor shortage is really hitting suppliers hard for sure. And, um, and it's really sort of a perfect storm of you know, supply chain issues and shipping costs going sky high and production, raw materials going up and you know the dollar um, versus the Chinese currency and, and lots of other problems that have been there, including, including this labor shortage that we've had and, and what that is doing from a, from a, from a service pers perspective for suppliers. So a couple of questions sort of woven into that, I guess, you know, as distributors, you're quite dependent in general on suppliers, you know, sourcing product and for producing the inventory and, and shipping the product quickly. Sort of, um, you know, one, I guess, what's your current experience, you know, with this, but most importantly, what, what are you doing as a distributor? Are you looking for alternative sources outside the chain? And some of you, you know, I think imported directly PPE. So what impact is this sort of perfect storm that suppliers are dealing with gonna have sort of in the immediate term, but also is it, how does it make you feel about the, the supply chain overall? And what kind of things do you think you need to start building into what you're doing? Uh, let's start with Phil. And I think it's definitely uh, a challenging time right now um, on the shipping front. And it's been, it's been pretty erratic throughout. Um, and really the last, I would say, you know, 16, 17 months have uh, the supply chain has been upside down in various ways uh, throughout. And so I, I think it'll, my guess is it'll continue to get a bit worse before it gets better. Um, there's lots of reasons as to why we've got all kinds of port issues and other things, and I, and I don't expect those to clear up uh, in the next uh, couple of weeks. So um, I think there's a challenge. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to focus on the things that we can control and just giving ourselves as many competitive advantages as we can in the marketplace to, to disrupt. And, and so I think, you know, from a from a marketplace disruption perspective, it, I think this does offer opportunities for us. It offers an opportunity for us to I would say have more direct conversations with our customers about um, about the the overall marketplace and educate them further. Um, you know, we've got our own sourcing team and our own house, our own in-house logistics team, uh, and we manage our own fully redundant supply chain. But still, nonetheless, in spite of all of that, there's still challenges that we face, and we have to really communicate those to our customers. So, um, you know, I, I think that that no matter what you do, uh, you're going to face some challenges of some sort. You know, we, we source now at this point, and it must be a few dozen countries. Um, but nonetheless, right, shipping is expensive from all countries right now at this point. Um, and it's not just a thing from China only. And so, um, you know, we, we were early on doing a lot of 
air shipping to go and get through things and the motion shipping and now everything's expensive. So, you know, th no matter what we kind of do, no matter which direction we turn, there's big challenges. We, we do view that as an opportunity though, to, to kind of rise above, I think some of the, the companies that are not up to the par uh, for that, not up to the challenge, um, but also to really just communicate and be transparent with our customers along the way um, as, to, as to where we're at. And, and what we found is most of our customers, if we educate them early on and we're super transparent throughout, um, they, they not only understand, they almost feel for us. Um, I think if we spring it on them last second and we didn't see it coming and then we bring it up to, towards the tail end, then that's when we have challenges. Um, as a company and as an industry. Joanne, what are you doing at Geiger to think about this problem of, of this supplier chain uh, issue? And, and I know you spend a lot of time outside the country as well. So how are you looking at it from, a, from an immediate term perspective, but also a longer term? And what impact do you think it'll have on the supply it's chain? Gonna it, it will have an impact. It's going to get worse before it gets better, uh, both in the U.S. And, and on a global basis. So that, that is a given. We've done a number of things. Uh, talk to our customers. We're trying to get them to order in advance, long lead times. Uh, we have reviewed all of our inventory levels and requirements for our corporate programs and accelerated triggers to acquire, bring in more inventory. So we're not, we're not running our inventories as low as we would have. Uh, because we have to up them to make sure that we have inventory available. It's impacted our decoration facilities, both in the U.S. and in, and in Europe, uh, because we have more blanks. Uh, so we're going to be, we will have to bring in more blanks for decorating for our, our clients and our programs to make sure that they'll have some products at the end. The thing that was surprised me, and I don't know if anybody else, anyone else has experienced this, but the uh, we have a lot of suppliers, many suppliers, who won't ship outside the country uh, goods that they have pro they've had in stock from Myanmar. And so we are actually having to bring some of their stock up to uh, both to London or to Lewiston and then to reship on a global basis out because certain firms just are not shipping, ex they don't have the expertise in house to take uh, items where their origin was from Myanmar. And some of these flare ups are starting to happen uh, from different countries as well. So we're taking the matters in our own hands, hmm. but it's going to uh, get worse. Yeah, that. It, it, how do you stretch your expertise in that manner? You know, that's that's really looking for expertise that typically distributors of, of, of any size really haven't had, uh, you know, because they've been so dependent on the, the supplier network. So, so how do you sort of stretch your team on that topic? Well, I think it's interesting to see you say stretch your team because our supply team is stretched. It's it's not easy. And they, you know, we've had to add two positions in our supply chain team. Uh, and in our expediting team, we've added positions. We have actually brought someone back and claims, because this impacts claims, it impacts billing, it impacts everything. Mm -hmm. Great, Joe, what's your take? Um, I, I, you know, kind of say, it's gonna get worse, the holiday season, um, just, break it and you know and i think the most important thing is educating customers um you have a uh there's been some great videos that have been created by logistics firms and the wall street journal had a great video that we um sent to our customers um helping them encouraging them to make decisions earlier and more quickly um sometimes they go through weeks long processes of deciding or making a decision so trying to you know coach that time period for them so that we can order um i think asi should buy a container ship <laughs> i'm kidding um but you know this holiday season you know watching what home depot did um you know is this going to be a thing that the big mega companies do is they commandeer or buy out container ships, which, um, you know, it, it could be really, really hard to get goods to the United States um, for smaller companies. Got a couple, thank you. I've got a couple more questions I want to cover before we wrap up and just remind people that uh, we're happy to take some questions so I've been able to weave in here a little bit. Um, Craig, let me let me jump to something about the State of the Industry Report, which is coming out shortly, that the top 40 distributor sales in um, uh, last year in 2020 represented about 
of the industry's uh, $21, million, $21 billion of sales, um, uh, up from 29% the year before. So 29% uh, from to 34%. And 25 years ago, the top 40 represented only about uh, 25% uh, of industry sales. So there's clearly some consolidations going on. It may have it may have been very exaggerated in 2020 because of the, you know, because PPE was so prevalent in the top 40 and less prevalent among some of the smaller distributors. But you know, as as that marches forward, you know, do you think that 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 consolidation that seems to be taking place um, in, the, in the top 40 is that an upside or downside to the industry? Neutral? What's your what's your take on consolidation? And by the way, do you think consolidation is going to continue uh, more aggressively once the economy? You know, continues to churn along. Uh, there's a lot of money out there among private equity, et cetera. So what's your, what's your take on all that? Well, first of all, I find it really interesting. And I actually ran that data a few years ago myself, maybe four or five years ago. I went back and looked and when it was the top 40. And then even before that, it was top 25. And I used the sales as numerator and did ran the same exercise and found this clear trend of consolidation on the supplier side and not on the distributor side. The distributor side stayed remarkably flat into the last few years. So I, I found those numbers and, and uh, Michelle Bell shared them with me not that long ago when I was talking with her. And it was it was a little surprising to me. And it's extremely interesting. Um, I think it really wasn't what I had expected, because when I ran the numbers, that wasn't the case. There's this big buzz of consolidation. Um, I do think for major clients. There's a bigger need of infrastructure now that whether it's it's compliance, um, whether it's the, the software that, that works with them, uh, insurance and things like that. Um, and I suspect that that's what's behind this consolidation. I suspect that we have a, a guy with us now, you can call it an acquisition if you want, um, but he joined us a few years ago. It's an office, it's a, it's a, it's a good salesperson and he had a deep relationship with a client and he joined basically to get a store to get a big a big piece of business from the client that he just wasn't going to get when he was on his own. It's just not that he's not skilled. They just were not going to give it to a company without the right balance sheet, without all those other things. And we just got it a couple of weeks ago, which we were really happy about. It did take a few years to do. Um, so I suspect that's what's behind it. I don't know. I, I, I know for us still, if you looked at the majority of our business, it still is not with giant companies. Uh, our average order went up a lot during the pandemic, but it still is $5,000. Mm -hmm. um, and most of them are with real companies, good companies, but they're not with these giant companies that have this thing. So I don't know if it'll continue. I suspect that for major clients, for major pieces of business, that trend is going to go only to the to the companies that are more capable to handle that, which is by and large going to be, let's say, your top 40 or whatever you want to call it. Um, but that for smaller companies, there'll still be a place for people who who don't have those capabilities. That'd be my best guess. But I guess we'll see. I was really surprised to see that information. It wasn't what I expected. Um, that's the like, most interesting things are the ones you don't expect, I think, right? <laughs> so that, that we, we try to generate some of that in the state. Yeah, well, it, it got me. I really, I, I was very, I, I, I enjoyed seeing that. So, um, yeah, but that's so, my guess. Yeah. Great. So, so Joe, let's switch to you because during this pandemic, you've gone through a, a transaction. So you want to just touch on that a little bit and, and, you know, the consolidation in the top 40, but also is, as presumably, you know, your, your investors want you to grow fast. So what's your, what's your outlook on this? So, um, I think for from where my seat, the upside is that we have the opportunity to add great, creative, talented sales people to our team. Um, and the upside for them is that they get a, the benefit, um, as Craig said, you know, the operational complexity and and um, you know shipping rates that are better because we're bigger um, and that helps their margin. So that's the opportunity for them. I do think in general consolidation um, removes some diversity of thought and experience from the industry and that um, can be an impact. But, uh, you know, I think also the pan what the pandemic has done and, you know, that was 
one of the opportunities for us in considering um, the sale of the company to a private equity firm was that it's an opportunity to help people who um, really struggled in the past year um, and uh, give them a place to land. So you're part of a public company. So what's your outlook on this consolidation and how do you use your position as a public company, one of the few really in the industry, uh, to be helpful in that? And I think I think consolidation inherently is, is neither good nor bad on its own. I think it does signal a sea of changes for you know, smaller to mid-side distributors. When, when I got into this industry, you know, I remember um, you know, selling t-shirts out of the back of my car and I could actually probably compete sometimes with with a Geiger or with a Jack Nadell as much as I was super intimidated by them you know 20 years ago um, it, it, I, I could I could win some business away from them and occasionally get a big program um, you know I think that that yeah I might be able to get some smaller business if I'm a smaller distributor still and and, and do that but I think it becomes more and more challenging for for smaller to mid-sized distributors to get uh, larger business and I, and I think the nature of our business is changing the fundamentals of of what we were providing, you know, five years ago uh, or ten years ago is really not the, the core value proposition today. Um, and I, I think just the, the, in general, the process of printing a logo on a product is, is a lot easier and more accessible than it's ever been. And uh, distributors that are just an intermediary in that process are 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 driving less value, and 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 probably it's a little bit more cumbersome uh, going through them in a lot of situations. So. You know, for us, we focus on being, you know, solutions-based company, having a solutions model where it's not just the, the printing of a logo on a fungible item. That, 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 that's not the value proposition anymore. It's, it's everything else that goes into that end deliverable, the technology, the product curation, the, the custom creative fulfillment, um, end user experience, the, the multi-channel marketing campaign. You have to bring so much to the table to really drive value. And so, um, you know, unfortunately, that, that's a resource rich thing. And so I think it's, it's more challenging. Um, and each one of those elements requires a lot of personnel and it requires a lot of experience. And, and so it only makes sense, I think, that the industry would move towards more scale. Um, and so I think you're seeing that consolidation in, in the top 40 um, as companies and sales reps look to, to keep up with the evolving demands of the marketplace. Um, so I, I think this is a trend that is not a trend, uh, meaning it's something that's here to stay. I don't think it's just something that's here today and gone tomorrow. I think overall, it's, it's probably um, going to lead to a better, a better value proposition that we can offer to our customers. And when I think about it, our industry, you know, our competition, of course, we're all kind of competitors on this call, but really some of our biggest competition is advertising dollars going elsewhere. That's where most of our, our real competition is. It's advertising dollars going towards digital marketing or TV. And... Um, and so we have to be able to offer more and more to be able to compete with those folks. And, uh, and, and so I do think that consolidation will help with, with some of that. Great. Joanne, you work for one of the longest standing companies in the industry. So you and your team have seen a lot. What's your view on consolidation? And then uh, my final question, I'll just warn my team uh, now. The final question is going to be, what's, your out, what's one word is for your outlook for 22? So we're going to sort of race past the rest of 21 and, and the one or two words that would describe your outlook for 22. So Joanne, first on consolidation. I think the trend is going to continue where more and more of the industry sales will be focused on the top 40 custom, uh, firms, distributors. You know, industry is two, two, two areas, B2B and B2C. B2C, those consumers who are buying the very small orders, sometimes the one-off orders, that will continue to shift towards the e-commerce companies because they can, they can handle those orders and they have, they have set up their infrastructure to high volume, very small orders. B2B, the large firms will have the infrastructure to handle that as well. And this, the mid-sized distributors, and when I say mid, the five to $20 million distributors, it's going to be tough for them to continue to keep up with the infrastructure. And it's the PCI compliance, it's the integrated punch out catalogs, it's that full service and Phil really articulated it well, it's the full service that clients uh, are demanding and the larger firms will be able to provide it because it costs so much for the technology. That's a real quick answer in regards to that. And the one word, is it one word for 2022, uh, Tim, or is it the one word for the balance of 2021? For 22, so the one or two words for the for, for 22 outlook. 
wild ride. <laughs> okay, Craig. Um, so I was going to bring this. I'll do a little ad uh, just real quickly, and and uh, I'm going to make my first domestic trip. I did go to London a couple of weeks ago, but we're traveling for work, and I'm going to go to your show in Chicago and go to the Great. awards thing. So Joanne, I want to congratulate okay. you for the. Uh, you were the person of the year last year, I know, and I think that was very well deserved and an excellent choice by ASI. Um, and I think that's going to going to segue to my answer. Um, I do think. There's a big pent up demand to be truthful. I go to that show sometimes and not other times, depending on the schedule. And I think people are going to the, the only thing missing now is events business. The business climate is pretty good. Unemployment rate is pretty go, low, which is good for us. There's lots of uh, lots of people trying to get market share. I, I think it's going to be a record year. I think record growth would be my thing. I think as as events right now is really the missing ingredient. I know we and I'm sure all of us on this call and probably most people listening directly or indirectly get a lot of business somehow associated with some kind of event and events mostly haven't been happening. And I think as they get back in the mix, to me, that's the final ingredient for business to do extremely well. And I, you know, I think that happens in the fall kind of thing. I don't know uh, my guess. I don't know, Tim, if you'll share my guess is your show won't have Bonzo attendance. Um, but I do think that that shows will have great attendance later, later this year and then next year. And, yeah, you know, shows and sales meetings, et cetera. Yeah, thanks for the plug. I should have done the plug myself, but I, I look forward to seeing uh, you. I'm a good straight man for you. At, at ASI, so the, uh, you know, and I think our attendance will be down for sure, and, and the exhibit space will be down, but we really want to be the first large show that opened up. We, we had to make that call in April. We had no idea whether Chicago was even going to co cooperate and let us even have more than 50 people in a room, but we sort of placed the bet, and, and I'm glad we did because I, I, I'm proud of the fact we're going to be opening it up. So, Couple of words on 22, Joe, and then we'll wrap up with Phil and we'll say goodbye to everybody in a couple of minutes. So, Joe. I would say I, I would sort of echo Craig fully back um, would be my two words. Um, once the events come back, um, I think we'll, we'll be exploding back. Great. Phil. My two words would be growth and gratitude. Oh. Great. Well, I'm very, uh, I have a lot of gratitude for, for all four of you for joining us today and, uh, and for all of our uh, listeners. We'll be you know, circulating this. We really appreciate all of you being here a year ago, a little more than a year ago, and also to follow up today. And I uh, look forward to seeing all of you in live events in person uh, in the coming months. So thank you very much and good, good, good luck to everybody. Congratulations for the success you've all had in managing and leading your businesses this year. Thanks so much. Take care. Thank you, Tim. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.